Hello and welcome to our presentation on testing PZO MEMS microspeakers. I'm Michael Ricci from XMEMS Labs in Santa Clara, California. I'd like to thank HBK for inviting me to participate in this electroacoustic virtual conference. I'm going to talk a little bit about PZO MEMS, what they are, how they're made, and then also the applications that they're intended for because I think that's a good background to get us prepared to discuss the testing, design of test, apparatus, uh, test scripts, and the results that we've been achieving in our EVK earbuds that we're sending around to companies worldwide. So I'll get started here with an introduction to PZO MEMS microspeakers. Before we talk about testing, let's try to understand a little bit more about the device under test. The device under test being a piezo MEMS microspeaker. Piezo MEMS microspeakers are a new class of small transducer. They bring together advancements in piezoelectric materials and MEMS fabrication techniques. These new microspeakers exhibit unique behaviors and have attractive audio attributes that are really compelling when compared to traditional electromagnetic dynamic drivers and balanced armature receivers. Since they're manufactured in a high production semiconductor fabrication foundry, they are repeatable devices. They are uniform part to part. They're very closely matched. They come out of the wafer foundry as finished speakers. No additional assembly required other than packaging them up into a speaker housing so they can be mounted into a product. They achieve an IP58 rating at the raw transducer level and are able to achieve 115 dB SPL at 20 Hz in an occluded earbud design. And here's a look under the hood. This is what Montero looks like if you were to see it outside of the package. You could see the gold. Uh, two by three array here in the lower left is uh, six cells configured together that we place inside a semiconductor package. We call that a compressed chamber. Uh, looks like a semiconductor package, but it's actually a speaker box. And that speaker box has a top port. It's also available in a side fire port as well. On the bottom side, you see a plurality of holes there's four holes underneath each one of the cells, and that helps to control the pressure inside the chamber and helps to keep the speaker operating within the area of high efficiency. There are some solder pads underneath and then a ceiling ring, as you can see on the bottom. To help design test fixtures, we have to understand the physical dimensions of the device under test. Here we have a couple of drawings. The drawing on the left is the Sidefire Monterra microspeaker, and the drawing on the right is the Top Port Monterra microspeaker. They're identical package dimensions and identical internal volumes. The only difference is, as you could see on the upper left hand side, the acoustic outlet for the side fire package emanates on the end of the package, whereas Monterra top fire has a sound outlet radiating off the top of the package. So this gives a couple of options to designers to position this in earbuds. And for testing, it involves two different types of fixtures to be designed that would have an equal front volume leading into, say, a coupler or another type of uh, testing a jig that you might be coming up with, like a test socket, if you will. One of the benefits of the semiconductor package is it's very robust. It's SMT reflowable and it has a metal lid and the metal lid can sustain some compression force which is common when positioning transducers into acoustic cavities. There's usually some PSA or some elastomeric material um, that you need to have to make an acoustic seal, and it's no problem at all to uh, have the top of the package pushing against that uh, material to make a seal or to take adhesives uh, so it can be glued into place. Microspeakers have their own inherent response 
on their own as a raw transducer. However, once they're positioned into an earbud, hearing aid, or in-ear monitor for musicians, ANC TWS uh, earbud design, as you'll see on the lower right here, uh, the response is going to change, obviously. So it's quite interesting to make measurements of your raw transducers uh, on test coupons or if you have the ability to design an audio test socket and then compare how that same transducer uh, measures uh, in the same measurement apparatus when it's placed into an industrial design. You know, the uh, acoustic uh, of the housing, the acoustic element of the front volume, whether there's a damper, uh, access to back volume venting, um, this all changes uh, the response characteristics of micro speakers. And so it's really interesting to test before uh, and after and compare the frequency responses and then also listen uh, with your ears which are the best microphones you have uh, the free of charge by the way and uh, compare uh, how the housing has affected uh, the output of the transducer here's a photograph of our tech bench in our audio lab was able to commandeer a small office in a quieter part of the building and did some light acoustic treatments to remove um, any echo that was going on in an empty room here with parallel walls and also installed a little bit of acoustic dampening. You can see some of the panels uh, mounted up behind me just to um, keep the room as quiet as possible within the budget that we had to work with. Most measurements I do uh, are in the evening or at night. However, even during the day, I'm able to use the uh, 711 coupler and the ear simulators as covered up by these uh, small acoustic uh, foam panels uh, on my little table there to the left. And no issue at all with background noise, able to make uh, full sweeps and there's no uh, disturbance to the to the measurements uh, in this setting here that we have in our office. You see a couple other things on the bench there. Uh, we have a mixing board, we have some powered monitors, and a power conditioner uh, to make sure the electricity is uh, filtered as much as possible. And then of course a, a laptop running uh, the audio analysis software called Soundcheck from Listen Systems. And all said and done, I think we're into this system for under $60,000. So not too bad. Uh, we didn't go for the hats, head and torso mannequin. It wasn't necessary for our type of work. We're just working with occluded earbud uh, designs, hearing aids, IEM or in-ear monitors for musicians and other types of wearables. And the setup works pretty well. As our main interface, uh, we're using the 3670 uh, BNK interface. It's 24 bit 96K. It has eight BNC uh, connections on the back, which can be configured for various things to be uh, connected. If you have other uh, transducers that require uh, a bias or uh, the preamp conditioning, uh, you can just open up the top and there's some dip switches on there that can be selected per channel. And then the two outputs we have set up uh, to stimulate our headphone amplifier uh, as left and right, and it works really well. So I mentioned earlier the 711 coupler and the 5128 ear sims. So I refer to things that are made out of metal as couplers, and I uh, choose to refer to the 5128s as ear simulators. I think they're more appropriately referred to as an ear simulator since uh, the work BNK has done to model them after um, several measurements of different human beings uh, that don't have metal tubes in their ears, believe it or not. Uh, I believe that these ear simulators uh, deserve the title of their simulator over a uh, metal tube uh, that isn't of the correct uh, length or dimension to um, most people's ear canals. So we're showing here uh, the kit that would come with a 711 coupler and you'll see uh, on the upper left hand side here um, the measurement uh, preamp and the microphone with the ear canal volume and then the different uh, adapters for uh, connecting different types of uh, earbuds and hearing aids uh, to the to the 711 metal coupler and the ear sims you can see positioned on the right hand side uh, we've got a set of glasses there with the uh, PZO MEMS micro speakers in some 3d printed housings uh, just trying to get some uh, close proximity very near field uh, uh, measurements on if these might transducers might have enough output to be appropriate for uh, wearable uh, glasses like you're seeing there.
and then to support uh, kind of free air, uh, small baffle, uh, large baffle measurements, uh, we picked up a very nice 4939 reference microphone and then a preamp conditioning uh, device, the 1708, to power that up. And we use that when we go to a local uh, vendor, uh, SETICOM in Milpitas. They have a very nice anechoic chamber um, that we're able to rent time in and uh, use that setup for making uh, some of the free air measurements uh, for the test coupons and some other transducers that we're working with. You can imagine that the uh, PZOMEMS micro speakers, being that they are extremely fast transducers with low latency, are going to be popular in TWS designs. And when we're working with TWS, we have to uh, stimulate the devices through Bluetooth. So uh, in working with uh, B&K, they had recommended that we pick up a Portland tool and die uh, Bluetooth interface. So it's a USB to Bluetooth interface um, that interfaces directly into sound check that's recognized as an approved piece of hardware. Very easy to install. I had it up and running and was testing my first set of wireless earbuds within 30 minutes of uh, opening the box. So pretty impressed with how plug and play uh, this was for us. Here we see the evaluation kit and the items that are included. So there are going to be a set of IEM style earbuds with the top port Monterra micro speakers mounted inside the earbuds. There's going to be an amplifier box. You get a Extreme Pro USB DAC and jumper cable to attach to your laptop. The other end of that goes into the audio in of the amplifier box. And then there's a TRRS to two MMCX connectors that go into the earbuds. Those same MMCX connectors are used on the test coupons, as you can see here on the upper right hand side. So you can use the same cable and same connection from the amplifier box right into the test coupons. We do supply a DC power source for doing the audio measurements. I highly recommend using uh, DC power uh, when making the measurements. And also, if you're using a laptop when making the measurements, unplug the laptop from the wall and run that on DC as well. Just to remove any AC coupling from coming out of the headphone jack of the laptop into the amplifier box. Always makes for quieter measurements that way. You can see in the upper right hand side um, some of the items that make up the 7-Eleven coupler adapter that we came up with. So I'll show you how that works. So 7-Eleven coupler has a collar that can be unscrewed and we just kind of turn it upside down here so it doesn't fall and we remove the conical section that usually holds the earbud tip and since the ear canal volume is actually located inside this section. We came up with this 3D printed housing. Uh, you can actually see the uh, Monterra diaphragm in the top part reflecting there in the light a little bit. And at the bottom there is an O-ring. And so what we'll do is we'll screw down the 7-Eleven coupler into the coupler adapter. Just kind of finger tight, not too tight, but enough to push against that O-ring and make a good airtight seal. And you can see on the top side, there's four um, hex that hold the top plate down and it sandwiches the test coupon uh, into the coupler adapter. As you can see in the upper right hand side here, there is a little elastomeric pad that goes in between the Monterra metal can and the coupler uh, adapter inlet to the 7-Eleven coupler, making sure there's an airtight seal on both sides. Uh, this thing works pretty good. Also, we'll put this back together here for a second. And one other thing I'd like to talk about briefly is insertion depth. So when you're working with earbuds that have different kinds of tips on them, uh, there's always different types of earbud design, different tube lengths and what have you. Uh, what you want to do is you want to make sure that if you're going to do any comparative measurements or benchmarking that you're inserting things as closely as possible to the same depth in the coupler. So I use uh, the comply tip as kind of my gauge and I slowly insert it. While I'm pushing down, I'm deforming the memory foam. Uh, I don't want to do it too fast 
just kind of slow enough where it kind of goes in on its own. But I'm going to stop inserting right when the comply tip is aligned with the outside of this inlet of the metal tube. And that is a, right about where I like it. Now, to make sure that doesn't come out on its own because the memory foam will probably, the closed cells of the memory foam will try to expand out. I always like to lay the 7-Eleven coupler down on a piece of foam. I have these triangle foam wedges uh, on my little test stand and basically just the, the weight of the 7-Eleven coupler on the earbud will ensure that that comply tip stays seated against this internal section of the coupler and make sure you, keep, you get an airtight seal that way. And if you use the comply tips on other earbuds, uh, it's a good indication of insertion depth. But everything might be a little bit different, so you just have to kind of adjust accordingly. If you don't believe you're getting a good uh, measurement because you're seeing maybe some low frequency roll off uh, with your measurements, uh, it's always good to keep a little putty around that you could seal around the earbud and place some putty around this uh, junction where the tip is. Or if the tip isn't working for you at all, you might not even need to use the tip at all. And you can just use some uh, putty or uh, wax compound and just try to insert the earbud into the ear tube, uh, centering it as best as you possibly can. It's a little more difficult without the tips, but it's possible. Probably a little less repeatable without using a manufactured tip like this. So in this slide we're going to talk about input stimulus. Since we have the EVK amplifier box uh, provided in the kit, we need to drive an input stimulus into the audio in of the EVK amplifier box. Uh, that's going to come from your audio analyzer. Uh, we're using Soundcheck software uh, with the BNK 3670 audio interface and the 7-Eleven coupler with the coupler adapter uh, and the air simulator. So when we go to put together the test script, um, we start with the standard headphone sequence and we open up the stimulus window for the headphone sequence. And that's the window I have open on the slide here. You notice that in the middle, it has stimulus type. We're using frequency stepped sweeps. We have a resolution of R80 or 124th uh, octave resolution. Next to that is the frequency range. So the frequency range uh, we start at is 20 hertz and we work up to 20 kilohertz. By default, listen starts at 20 kilohertz and goes down to 20 hertz. Um, traditional electromagnetic dynamic drivers, um, they behave a little bit differently uh, than our PZO MEMS. Our PZO MEMS has a resonant peak up near 20 kilohertz. We're generating the most amount of our uh, amplitude in the high frequency range. And so uh, just to be uh, kind of safe and cautious, I like to start at 20 hertz and work up to 20 kilohertz. And also I'm mindful of the input stimulus levels. On the left-hand side of the slide, you can see level input stimulus. Um, what this conversion is, is the equivalent volts peak to peak that the EVK amplifier will deliver to the earbuds for the millivolt RMS input stimulus coming from Soundcheck. So we tend to start our measurements at 42 millivolts RMS, which is two volts uh, peak to peak. That doesn't quite generate 94 dB SPL at 1K, but um, we consider that kind of the minimum drive level uh, to get your first sweeps. Um, we step up then to 89 millivolts RMS, which equals four volts peak to peak, and will generate 94 dB SPL in the earbuds in the coupler. A uh, little bit less than the ear sim. So the ear sim, uh, not being a metal tube and also having a longer uh, ear canal uh, length, uh, will uh, require a little higher drive to get to uh, the 94 dB uh, SPL. So 94 dB SPL at 1K um, is achieved in the coupler at four volts peak to peak, but on the ear sim, it takes a, a, a little bit more uh, stimulants because that uh, material is dampened a little bit and the, the, the tube length's a little bit longer. Uh, the max drive uh, that the uh, 
amplifier box can generate is 30 volts peak to peak, and that equates to 710 millivolts RMS uh, uh, generated by the 3670 interface from the sound check. Uh, stimulus window. If you look down on the lower section on the right hand side, you'll see step size. So we've been experimenting with these step sizes um, over the last year or so, and we've worked with uh, five cycles transitioning at one kilohertz for five milliseconds. We've used 10 cycles transitioned at 1k for 10 milliseconds. We've gone up to 20 step cycles and 20 milliseconds and also transitions at 1k and hasn't haven't seen any change in the response so really it just depends on your individual preferences but for for me um i choose 10 1 and 10 it's about an 18 second uh, duration test from beginning to when it displays the frequency response and we actually have good results with the test script uh, as we're using it here. So if you have any questions about uh, the test script uh, and you're putting yours together, you can always request a copy of the test script that we've put together. We're happy to send it to you and you can import it into your sound check system and use it exactly as we are. This will help correlate your measurements with ours. So here we're going to show the frequency response plot of Monterra. I've positioned a full range balanced armature uh, frequency response plot next to uh, Monterra. And since I wanted to kind of compare the responses, I've aligned the charts uh, so that the equivalent sound pressure level of 110 dB SPL uh, is at 200 hertz as a straight line across there. So you can get an idea that Monterra has that increasing amplitude as heading towards the resonance, as I described earlier. Um, or you can also see on the right side, the BA uh, kind of dips down in the mid-range, comes up to a peak, dips down again, comes up to another peak below uh, the red dotted line, then dips down again, it comes up to a peak, and then dies off. And so... Most BAs and most dynamic drivers will have um, at least two or more uh, peaks and valleys in the response in the upper uh, octaves, whereas Monterra does not exhibit this behavior. Um, it's nearly flat uh, from 20 up to about 800. And as you can see, right about 850, it rises up and it rises up uh, from two uh, to four and right about five, six K, it starts heading up towards the resonance. And you can see here we're achieving uh, our highest peak somewhere around oh, almost 18 kilohertz there. And so with this extra amplitude uh, comes responsibility because it's generating sound at a higher level in the mids and the highs, that's not going to be pleasing to listen to. Uh, we recommend that this is EQ'd. So we've come up with some EQ curves that we supply with the EVK kit. Uh, we run an APO uh, equalizer uh, in Windows, and it sits between the browser. So if you're playing back music on YouTube Music or Amazon Music, and you're streaming that through your laptop, and you're configured with the APO software into our EVK kit, and you're running, say, Soundcheck as well on the same system, you can uh, enable the equalizer, and you can attenuate all of the highs and mids to your liking. You can actually shape the frequency response uh, to any frequency response uh, um, profile that you'd like to have, the Harman curve or other. And the one thing I've noticed about working with Monterra is that the speaker takes EQ really, really well, and I don't have to boost anything. Uh, with equalization, we kind of know from audio, uh, always better to cut than to boost. And so that's exactly what Monterra gives us. If we think about uh, the emerging OTC or over-the-counter augmented hearing device uh, product category that's emerging now with new Hera and 
New Hera and Bose and uh, Jakati uh, partnering with uh, Qualcomm. Uh, you know, there's smartphone apps now that uh, will come with these uh, TWS earbuds and the listener can enter in uh, feedback and inputs and the DSP in the system will alter the frequency response to the user's uh, preferences. So for people with mild or moderate hearing loss, they may um, be experiencing hearing loss by and large in the uh, upper mids or lower high frequency bands, somewhere between say two and eight kilohertz seems to be kind of the area where uh, people are, seem to be losing some of their hearing. And you can see that Monterra has uh, a lot of amplitude in that range. And so uh, for those types of products, uh, this frequency response uh, curve um, is actually welcome. We've been hearing from hearing aid companies and working with a few of them and they're pleased with this response and they're shaping it according to um, the hearing assessment profiles um, that they're getting from audiology. So I thought that was pretty interesting to talk about for a moment. Let me move on and show uh, an additional frequency response plot from a multi-driver uh, earbud set that I've measured as well. Just as another example of uh, frequency response for comparison, here is a three driver earbud um, that I measured. It has a dynamic for the low end and two balanced armatures. So there's three uh, speakers, if you will, inside this earbud. And it looks like it has pretty close to the Harman curve, a little jaggedy, um, kind of falling off a little bit above 10K. Now, this particular earbud is going to have a characteristic sound. It has a nice, pleasing sound for some music. Uh, for other types of music, this frequency response curve is not complementary. So one of the things I do like about Monterra having that extra amplitude in the mids and the highs is that just with attenuating things with equalization, you can arrive either at a flat frequency response or you can arrive at a frequency response that has uh, a little more presence or you can um, attenuate as much of the mids and the highs as, as, as you'd like um, without having to worry about any peaks or valleys that are inherent uh, in, in the transducer or when using multiple transducers. On this slide, I'm showing the response of the Monterra top port test coupon with uh, a mesh applied to it. So received a lot of samples from different mesh and uh, membrane vendors uh, that are meant to both protect uh, the acoustic port and also to shape the frequency response in a desirable fashion. So in this particular experiment, we use the 7-Eleven coupler adapter, test coupon, the EVK kit, and the top line in purple is the response without the mesh applied. And then the uh, bottom two sweeps um, have uh, the mesh on the coupon and you can see it kind of narrows the uh, peak a little bit. These peaks are occurring right where the coupler resonant peak is so it's a little difficult to tell how much contributing factor uh, the mesh is really having because it happens to be uh, uh, working looks like right in the range of the coupler resonance. So I'm looking forward to testing these in uh, the ear sim and looking at uh, the effect of the mesh in the ear sim. I think the ear sim will show a little bit different uh, response because of the higher dampening, longer ear canal uh, length. Um, so the acoustic impedance is going to be different and that resonance is going to be pushed out a little bit and not be so high. So I think I might have a better uh, understanding of what the mesh is actually doing to uh, the frequency response in using the 5128 ear sims as compared to the 711 coupler. But I thought it was nice to show another uh, response curve here. Again, you can see the uh, pretty good flat frequency response, really nice LFRO uh, all the way down to 20 hertz, and then a little bit of rise at 850 into 1K, and then it gently rises up uh, to resonance. At the beginning of the presentation, I was talking about some of the unique attributes of the PZO MEMS transducer. And one of the things that stands out to me as one of the biggest benefits uh, for this type of transduction mechanism is its fast mechanical response and fast uh, recovery and settling. You can see here uh, 
Montero is being compared to a popular dynamic driver um, that we harvested from a uh, popular <laughs> headset uh, that um, lots of people use. And you can see Montero is extremely fast. It reacts quickly and it stops quickly. The settling time uh, is pretty astonishing. And I have a CSD plot I'll show on the subsequent slide that further validates this point. Here we're showing two CSD plots, cumulative spectral decay, uh, PZO MEMS on the left, which is the Monterra side fire mounted on a test coupon. And on the right side is a dynamic driver, pretty high end and expensive dynamic driver. Uh, these were positioned in the 7-Eleven coupler at similar depths. And uh, I think the plots speak for themselves. If you haven't seen CSD before, I can kind of talk you through a little bit of what's going on here. So we're looking for resonances that are occurring after the uh, response stimulus. And as you can see on the left, Monterra does not exhibit any resonances occurring um, after the decay of the initial response, where the dynamic driver has some uh, resonances occurring. You can see the periodic uh, uh, intervals here as it comes forward in the display. And uh, that's occurring right around 1.2 kilohertz in the middle of the audio band. So like I was mentioning earlier about the PZO MEMS transduction mechanism, it's an extremely fast transducer. It starts quickly, but it also stops quickly. And so the amplifier circuit is really in complete control of the movement of the diaphragm without any dampening or spring or other um, uh, elements of the transducer's behavior that affect uh, the, the kind of spectral accuracy. Uh, the spectral accuracy meaning that if an instrument uh, is hit and decays, um, you probably want a speaker that doesn't make that decay last longer or shorten that decay, but is natural uh, to the input stimulus and accurate. And that's what this last slide, I think, um, uh, shows us, is that uh, these types of transducers uh, do behave very well to incoming voltage, and they're able to move quickly, they're very fast, and they stop fast, which means that you're going to get very accurate sound reproduction. I enjoy working with these new type of micro speakers. They've provided uh, quite a bit of entertainment and some challenges, and uh, they never cease to amaze me. I've yet to blow one up, and we have one running for, I believe, 13 plus billion cycles nonstop uh, with 30 volts peak to peak, which I believe is getting somewhere around three and a half years of continuous use without failure. So I believe that the future is here with a new type of transduction mechanism for micro speakers as appropriate for uh, occluded earbud designs. If you've got some questions and you'd like to discuss any of the information shown here today, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. My contact information is listed here. I'll do my best to get back with you in a timely manner. Be well, be happy, and thank you again for your time today.